You know, in today's world, we all grew up thinking that bison were just a Western Plains animal, that elk are a Rocky Mountain animal, you know, that antelope are a Western Plains animal, and, you know, only deer existed coast to coast. Well, that's not the case. All of those ruminants existed from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from south of the Arctic Circle, down to the Gulf. Every one of them. And we had multiple subspecies. The only bison species that we have existing today in North America is the bison, 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 or the plain, plains bison. Okay, that's it. And the only reason we have those is because Teddy Roosevelt stepped in you know, to, to, to save the remnant of under 2,000 that was left. But we had a woodland bison, we had a savanna bison, uh, and, and a number of other species that once existed. As a matter of fact, we have records, historical records, from when the last bison were either killed or spotted in every south, current southeastern state. And most of those, the last bison spotted in the southeast was in 1825. That was the last one. Uh, most of them were gone, you know, by the mid-1700s, to be honest with you. By the late 1700s, almost all elk had disappeared from the eastern portion of the U.S. So, again, historical ecological perspective is critically important. Um, so, prairie, the second type of ecosystem in the southeast was savanna. We didn't have these dense, thick, choked woodlands that we see today. We think of woods today, when you look at the southeastern U.S., we think that was normal. That's what it looked like, you know, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, we had immense virgin timber, and, but up underneath that, it was very open. It was so open that it was easy for wagon trains to pass through these savannas, these woods, this forest. That's what the forest was at that point in time. But it was very, very open. Entire wagon trains could pass through. And, you know, one of the earliest exploration parties was Hernando de Soto uh, in the 1500s. And we know where they landed in that initial exploration party on the Gulf Coast. We know where they traveled as they made their loop through the southeast, and we know where they were each day of that exploration. So we know how rapidly they traveled. And when DeSoto landed, he had more than 600 men, many of them on horseback, supply wagons, and a herd of more than 500 pigs. Now, those pigs are where we get all our feral pigs in the U.S. today. So we can thank DeSoto and other, other Spanish explorers for all of our wild pig problem because they started going feral and so forth, and, and that's hence all of our pig problem. But um, if DeSoto, in this very large party that he traveled with, had hit the Gulf Coast and encountered the dense, choked woodland that we see today, they would have turned around, got on their ships, gone back to Spain and said, this is an impenetrable wilderness and we don't want anything to do with it. But they were able to travel very easily with that large of a party and all of that support because it was plains or prairies and savannas, open wooded savannas. So again, we've got to retrain ourselves on what we think. And as a matter of fact, in the Southeast, we had the greatest number of plant species in our prairies, more than the Midwestern prairies. We had more plant species than the Midwestern prairies down here. Now let me ask you a question, guys. We're very different today. In terms of diversity of species out there, where do we compare today versus where we were 500 and 1,000 years ago? Anywhere in the U.S., anywhere in the U.S. Where do you think we are today? Worse. Worse? Yeah. 
a little bit worse, a lot worse, a lot worse, all right? How do you think that impacts genetics and epigenetics? Do you think it has any influence on it whatsoever? Yes. It has a profound influence on it. Huge, huge. So when we think about that, guys, and the lack of diversity that we have today and the level of soil degradation that we have today, that is profoundly impacting the genetics that we have today and the epigenetics that we have today. So again, when you're thinking, where in the heck is he going with, why is he talking about historical ecological perspective? This is a genetics workshop. Well, this has everything to do with the genetics and expression of those genetics today and what we are experiencing in our livestock and our crops and everything else that exists out there. So again, I was taught in elementary school that the eastern U.S. before the European settlers was so densely wooded that a squirrel could jump in a tree at the Atlantic and not touch ground again until it hit the Mississippi River. But once again, that's not true. Okay, a very, very false concept of what this landscape will look like. The Western landscape. Do you know that the Western landscape used to be incredibly well watered? Uh, there were beaver, otter, all types of water animals that existed. Uh, moose were very widespread. Uh, it, it, it's unbelievable how well watered the Western landscape used to be. But by the time, when did your family get out there? In the mid, uh, oh, 1875. Okay. So unfortunately, by the time they got there in 1875, that entire landscape had already had 200 plus years of degradation. Now they, they certainly didn't think that when they first saw it because they had never seen it before. And they thought that's what it was, right? And they thought it was pretty good at that point. But the truth is, it was only a shadow of what it would have been 200 years prior to that. Why? What had happened prior even to, in many of those areas, even prior to the 1800s and certainly by the 1850s, what had happened? What, what was going on in that part of the world prior to the 1850s? Okay, we have Native Americans, but who else was there and what were they doing? Okay, well you had the gold rush, but what else? Okay, there you go. The fur trappers. And what were the fur trappers predominantly after? Beaver. Beaver. Okay. And how did the Native Amer were the Native Americans complicit in that as well? Yeah, they traded with them quite a bit. Okay. So even the Native Americans became a little greedy, right? And they were not, um, you know, uncompliant here. They, they were complicit in, in, what, in all, of, all that happened. And so the trappers are the ones, unfortunately, that started the big downturn and that caused the significant loss of water and water cycle in the western U.S. And we've got a client north of Grand Junction, Colorado, has a half million acre ranch there. When you look at the history there, and they, they comprise two different valleys in between ranges, and when you look at when Cortez, Spanish explorer, came through that region, when they described what they saw, when they first stuck their heads over those ridges into those valleys there in the Grand, north of Grand Junction, they described a scene that is far, far, far different than what we see today there. Today, it's pretty much desert, you know, very dry, very, very dry. And, and, you know, growth of anything is sparse. But yet what they described was that in the valleys, 
there was grass higher than a horse's head and so thick that you could not navigate your way through it. As a matter of fact, they followed the trails that were up on the mesas and the benches because those were the same trails that the Native Americans had made and followed because again, the dense, thick grasses that grew in the valleys. And they talked about how well watered those valleys were. Moose were abounding everywhere. Beaver, river otter, all of those types of things were just absolutely everywhere. And folks, this was just, uh, you know, this wasn't that long ago, okay? And so what happened was that when the first settlers from the east moved into that area, then, you know, the, the ranchers saw enormous opportunity because of all of this grass. In these valleys, they were shoving in the 1800s 10,000 head of cattle up each valley. There was plenty of water, plenty of grass, 10,000 head up each valley. Do you know how many head can be sustained by either of those valleys today? About 300, 300, okay? So think about that. They went from 10,000 head in the 1800s to 300. So what happened in the intervening years? Well, the beaver and otter had already been trapped out, so that was gone. That started the decline of the water cycle. Then these guys, um, once the ranchers sort of mowed that grass down <clears throat> with their cattle, the sodbusters saw it the farmers, and the sodbusters said, wow, this is great for farming, but it's still too much water. So what did the sodbusters do? What was the first thing they did to remove water? They dug ditches, okay? That's the only option you had in those days, right? So they dug ditches to, to drain these valleys. Most of these ditches at that time were about that wide and about that deep. Okay, that they dug. <clears throat> dug them by mule and with pans, pans with mules. Well, today, do you have any idea how big those ditches are? A lot of them are the same. Some of them are larger. Many of these ditches today are now uh, 100 foot across and 30 to 40 foot deep through erosion, right, erosion. And as a matter of fact, as uh, recently as the 1920s, some of these ditches that you can't even begin to think about jumping across today, <clears throat> in the 1920s, we have accounts where men could just easily step across them, okay? So we have dramatically altered the landscape. And, and today, you can't farm it without what? Irrigation, right? You're heavily dependent on irrigation. So folks, that's historical ecological perspective. And, and it really matters, and it matters genetically, okay, because it has altered our genetics. I love this quote by William Clark to give us additional perspective on that. Uh, the Lewis and Clark exploration, this was in, on July the 4th, 1804. Now, William Clark was a magnificent writer, but a horrible speller. So th this is his own spelling out of his, his diary. But on July the 4th, they were near Donovan County, Kansas, and he said, the plains of this country are covered with elite green grass, well calculated for the sweetest and most nourishing hay, interspersed with copses of trees, spreading their lofty branches over pools, springs, or brooks of fine water. Groups of shrubs covered with the most delicious fruit are to be seen in every direction. And nature appears to have exerted herself to beautify the scenery by the variety of flowers, delicately and highly flavored, rising above the grass, which strikes and perfumes the sensation and amuses the mind and then he goes on to say, in, in a country situated far removed from the civilized world, to be enjoyed by nothing but the buffalo, elk, 
deer and bear in which it abounds and savage Indians. So look at the scene he described and think about that. This was in 1804. When was William Clark born and where? Does anybody know? In the 1770s in Virginia. Okay. He had to go all the way out to eastern Kansas in 1804 to experience a scene like this. In other words, the entire eastern U.S. by 1804 had become so devoid of what he saw there that this totally, totally blew his mind by 1804. And he talks about the savage Indians, but I'm going to ask who were the savages. <laughs> Looks to me like the Indians were enjoying an Eden. They were yeah. living there good. They, they, they had a great life, an absolutely fabulous life. And, uh, yeah, so again, who are the savages here? But, uh, and we, we taught an academy in June out in New Mexico. This was on the host ranch. Um, but I want to show you this video. This is four different species of life, or livestock, wild ruminants, all, uh, all on the same ranch running together okay so we have elk antelope mule deer whitetail deer all running together but what keystone species is missing from that group the bison exactly the bison so my point here guys is this the way that we've been taught to envision things that the bison just ran in large herds by themselves you know, or the antelope just by themselves was not true at all. You know, it was much more like the American Serengeti, where all of these species were intertwined with each other, and many more species as well, bird species and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, that's what we're seeing return again to a certain extent, and here's some of the bird species, some wild turkeys there on the CS Ranch, uh, but we're starting to see, as we get things right again, we're starting to see a return of many different species, all existing together again. Now, I'm going to ask you who said this and when, but a few more years of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support, whereas if they were taught how to improve the old soil and instead of going in pursuit of the new and productive soil, they will make these acres, which now scarcely yield them anything, turn out beneficial to themselves. Who said it? Yeah. George Washington, 1796. We're a brand new country. And here he was talking about we'd already farmed out the Atlantic states. We'd already so severely degraded our soils by the time we were a brand new country that people were having to move west to find new soils to plow under and repeat the same process of degradation. And we have continued to do that over and over over the last, last two centuries. <clears throat> and then this, uh, this excerpt from Wayne Angus Ferris, he was uh, explored the Rockies from 1830 to 1835. And he describes... Uh, you know, it talks about uh, bison and poor, poor flesh were the worst diet imaginable, but as they became fat, okay, remember we talked about fat, okay, we grew strong and hardy, and now not one of us is but ready to insist that no other kind of meat can compare with that of the female bison in good condition. They didn't want lean meat, okay, like we're taught to eat today, okay, they didn't want lean meat. They wanted the fat. And with it, we require no seasoning. They can boil, roast, fry it, or cook it as they please and live upon it solely without bread or vegetables of any kind. Okay, we never tire of it or disrelish it. Now why? Why was that? 
Why could the Native Americans, why could these early explorers and others live on this high fat, animal protein only diet and thrive? Why? They're eating such a diverse forage that they had a lot of nutrients in within the meat. Bingo. Yeah, so yes, they, they had a very, very diverse array of forages. Uh, much more highly biologically active soils with a greater organic matter and carbon content. Nutrient cycling was far better at that time. Water cycling was far better at that time. So that allowed these bison and anything else they hunted and killed for their food to be much more nutrient dense in their content. And now, Native Americans and these early explorers, when they made a kill, what was the first thing they, first two things they would eat off of any carcass? First two things. First two things they would eat off of any carcass. Okay, organ meats and fat. Okay, they would go after the organ meats and fat first. The leanest portions of the carcass, they never would even eat. They would just feed those to their dogs. So they wouldn't even eat that. They would throw them to the dogs and the scavengers. So they ate the organ meats and the fattiest parts of the carcass. All right. So let's start with the foundation for truly solid genetics, and that's healthy soil. That seems sort of antithetical, right? You would think I would start with some kind of genetic factor or EPDs or EBVs or pedigrees or DNA markers or whatever, or even crossing of breeds or strategies for line breeding. And we're gonna talk about all of that, but the foundation, if you want truly solid genetics, you gotta start with the foundation of everything, of all of life, and that's the soul. And that gets us to regenerative agriculture. So regenerative agriculture is farming and ranching in synchrony with nature and the four ecosystem processes to repair, rebuild, revitalize, and restore ecosystem function, starting with life beneath the soil and expanding to life above the soil. Success hinges on applying the six principles of soil health and the three rules of adaptive stewardship, and it allows us to be able to have continuous improvement of our degraded soils, ecosystem, and climate. Here's the four ecosystem processes. This is what we are so heavily damaged, and this is why we have broken genetics today and epigenetics. Energy, water cycle, mineral cycle, and community dynamics. All of those are critical and crucial if we want to have really solid functioning genetics in our livestock. So if we look at energy, that's sunlight and photosynthesis. The water cycle is our ability to capture and cycle water through soil and plants. The mineral cycle is the ability to function nutrients through our plants, through the soil, and it includes a fully functioning carbon cycle and then community dynamics. This is ecosystem biodiversity with complex plant life, which leads to resilience and productivity. So it all starts beneath the soil surface, the soil food web. Everything beneath the soil impacts the microbiomes and the genetics of everything above the soil surface. And if we look at what's going on beneath the soil, there's more life or should be in healthy soils. There's more life beneath the soil surface than above it. 90% of soil function is mediated by microbes, but the microbes depend on the plants. So the way we manage our plants and the way we manage our livestock is crucial to what's going on beneath the soil surface. 
And what we now know is that plant growth and health is highly correlated with how much life and what kind of life is in the soil. That means microbes matter. The micro microbial community structure is crucial. And these two ratios, the fungi to bacteria ratio in the soil and the predator to prey ratio in the soil are very, very critical. The, these two things right here, most people from a genetic standpoint never even consider those or think about them. But those two things have a profound impact on epigenetics. Far, far more than we may ever think. Far more.